from the campus studios of Sarland University, this is Ropecast, a lighthearted podcast for learners of English, with Roger Charlton and Peter Tischer. Hello, listeners. Here we are with another Ropecast, our podcast for teachers and learners of English and people interested in the English language. And I'm welcoming back Carrie today to the studio to continue our little chat about the sounds of English and what is important for learners and for teachers. Hi, Hi. Carrie. Hi, Roger. Nice yeah. to be here. Uh, we briefly dealt with sounds last time, that is individual sounds, but of course pronunciation involves a whole lot more than that. Right? Mm-hmm. I well remember when I was very young, one of my brother's best friends was from an African country. Mm-hmm. And when we first met with this guy and came to stay with us for Christmas, we all had problems understanding him, even though he, English was his medium from being like three years old. Mm-hmm. And that had to do with rhythm. So maybe we could say a few words about that. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's, there's quite a lot of research on that. Um, so a lot of times when people do pronunciation teaching, they focus on consonants and vowels. Yeah. But what a lot of research shows is that's not actually the really important thing. The important thing is stress and prosody and intonation. And a lot of times misunderstandings arise, not because a consonant or a vowel was mispronounced, but because the stress placement was not where it would be expected to be in an individual word. Yeah. And then also sometimes within a sentence. And I've heard mm. I've heard speakers uh, like you described there and where the rhythms are very different. It becomes so hard to understand. Yeah. Because certain languages have more or less an equal time for each syllable. Yeah. And English is not like that at all. No, no. We sometimes like shorten our vowels and lengthen them depending yeah. on, on the stress placement. And yeah. some vowels disappear completely in rapid speech. Yeah. Yeah. And I've noticed too, I mean, you're from the U.S. originally, mm-hmm. and in U.S. pronunciation and British pronunciation, often there are differences, mm-hmm. which sometimes I'm, I have to like listen twice. Yes. Like the first time I heard the word aluminum, well. I didn't know what the person was talking about. That's how I felt with controversy. Oh, yes. Uh, that was very different for me because, of course, I say controversy. Yeah. So this is word stress. Yeah. But then there's also the whole sentence or the whole utterance mm-hmm. where mm-hmm. The, the prominent or less prominent syllables play a part. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then we also have intonation, of course, which yes. is also part of the meaning that is uh, carried by language. Yeah, exactly. Um, and the listeners might be aware of this. Uh, if you're listening to a speaker and sometimes they do something in the way they're talking and then they stop and you didn't expect them to stop. They mm-hmm. had rising intonation. It indicates that something more is coming and then yeah. they stop, right? So this this rising intonation can sometimes indicate questions. Um, it can also sometimes indicate that more information is coming. And then we have the falling intonation whenever we have like some sort of declaration, yeah. right? Yeah. So that would be a sign. Um, I said what I want to say. It's your turn mm-hmm. now. Mm-hmm. One of those signals in discourse that... Um, yeah. Something is coming to an end. Exactly. Or yeah. I'm going to give you a list, and here's the list that's coming, and then you also hear that's the last item in that list. Although I've noticed that many younger speakers of English do, in fact, have a rising intonation, and they stop, and that yes. doesn't mean they've got more to say. Yeah, yeah. It's it's well documented in, in younger speakers all over the world. I think a lot of times it happens in, in the U.S., and I associate it with California, but it, it mm. probably is wider spread than that, and I think it's very common in Australia. And they call it upspeak. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, there was a theory in Britain that it entered British English through Australian soaps. Uh, I don't know yeah. if that's true. I mean, that may be just a rather facile explanation. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly, there was a time in Britain when people watched these Australian soaps week yeah. by week, day by day, and it may have had a, an impact. Yeah, that's possible. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Which brings us around to um, the sort of international situation of English today. Mm-hmm. And I think maybe it would be interesting if you could say a few words when this typical situation, non-native, talking to non-native in English, yeah. and often there are problems, yeah. would you have something to say about how people could prepare for that kind of situation? Hmm. I don't know. I mean, because that's... Because it kind of depends on a number of factors. I mean, yeah. are you talking about more like accent problems? Or... Accent would certainly come into it. Yeah. Um... I think a lot of times, you know, when people are talking, you're you're able to self-correct and ask questions, right? Mm-hmm. It's a little bit different to, you know, when you think about reading, then the author just has what they have to say and yeah. you can't have that, that dialogue. Um, but I think when you have non-native and non-native speaking, you know, you shouldn't be afraid to ask for clarification, mm-hmm. right? Um, and I think a lot of people might be surprised at, if you're patient and you try, how easy it is to understand an accented speaker. 
And a lot of times it's possible to have a strong accent, but actually be very, what we would call in research, comprehensible. That means that even though you're accented, it's easy to understand what you mean. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Of course, we haven't mentioned the cultural background, which can mm -hmm. be part of a misunderstanding as oh, well. Oh, yeah, but sure. That's a whole other topic. So yeah. <laughs> we won't go into that today. Yeah. So thank you very much for your contribution again, Kerry. And thank I hope you, we can bring you back soon. Yeah, gladly. Bye. Bye-bye. You've been listening to Ropecast, brought to you by Saarland University, featuring Roger Charlton and Peter Tischer. Tune in for the next edifying episode on your podcast dial.